Okay, so there are several minutes and we will start. We welcome our speaker, Russell. Hello, Russell. Hey, how are you? Um, yeah. Did you want to get started now or give people a few minutes? I don't think so. Basically, we cannot just start now because we have whole three minutes to go. So yeah. it would be just bad for us to start now because people will arrive just in time. I'm so sure. <laughs> I, I believe you. It's um, one of the number one things I've learned from the amount of time I spend on Zoom now is that almost everybody can be on time for meetings. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a remarkable thing because if you have in-person meetings, no one shows up on time. <laughs> well, Torfin's here, hey Torfin. Morning. 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 <laughs> yeah, right. So will not let me share until whoever is sharing stops. Um, I do share and I will stop now, I promise. I did. Cool. All right, I'll get started here and I guess it's probably about time. Um, but before I do, I just want to take a quick informer, informal poll of the class. So for today, I didn't plan anything that requires you to have access to uh, Unix terminal. Uh, but I think it would be better to do some of the exercises we typically do in class um, using a Unix or Unix-based operating systems. Uh, so what I'm wondering is, is how many of you um, have access to this? Either your laptop is a Mac or, or some flavor of Linux, or you can sign into a server that has these sorts of things um, easily. And I don't know how to create a poll on here, so I need uh, I need you either to type into the chat, yes, I have this, or no, I don't, or something like that that gives me some feedback on this. I will try to create a poll now. Thank you. Um, it, it just affects what I set up for next time. So that's this is why okay. I'm trying to get information now, is how comfortable you are doing this sort of thing. Um, OK. For this time, what I'm going to talk about is uh, mostly kind of the kind of some biological background on how we get to genomes, right? And um, I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second. So the beginning of this course started with Rasmus uh, telling you about uh, really the fun and interesting parts of population genetics, why you should do it. And in that, in that way, the course is a little bit backwards because uh, what we're gonna do is take a step back from there and talk about how you can even get to those points of making inferences from genome sequence data. Um, and so today I'm going to tell you about what's been read here before, uh, which is going to be uh, a little bit about genetic variation, so the structure of genetic variation, the structure of genomes, uh, and about sequence data, so how we can go about looking at sequence data. Um, okay. Okay, yeah. Um, and from there, we're going to, I'll also be doing weeks five and six before I hand it off to Torfin, who will do the end of the class. I think this actually might be five, six, and seven. The numbers might be slightly wrong, but anyway. Um, so from there, we'll go into genome assembly next time. And that's where I'd like you to have access to some sort of Unix-based system so you can run some simple examples. They'll be short. It doesn't need to be a powerful system, but it needs to be able to uh, run simple, simple code. And I'll I'll send out instructions for the kinds of things I need you to have access to uh, well before class. So you have some time to get them installed, so don't worry. But I just want to make sure this is going to be possible. Um, at the end, we'll get into read alignment, uh, read filtrations, things like that, and some of the newer ways that people are doing read alignment. And from there, you'll have what's called a um, so a filtered BAM alignment file, uh, and that's kind of the core data object that people are using to do population genetics today uh, using genome sequence data, and that's. Uh, where Torfin's going to pick up, which is great because we've written a whole suite of programs to use those kinds of data to do awesome population genetic inference. So he's uh, really the right person to take that on. And I think I'm excited to see that part of the class too. So it's going to be great. <laughs> okay. Um, just a quick outline for today. There's Torfin. Ah, see, I say nice things and they come online. There he is. <laughs> uh, the, the, today we're going to do, um, I'm just giving you a quick outline for the class today. I'm gonna start by telling you about the structure of genomes. And actually, what we're gonna do really quickly is leave this presentation altogether and, and go to check out the UCSC genome browser. Um, there are other browsers out there, just so you know. So if you don't like the layout or the format of this one, 
Uh, there's, you know, the Ensemble browser is fantastic. There's quite a few others. Um, there's many organism specific ones, but this is the one I know and use. So that's what I'm demonstrating. Uh, for what it's worth, they're highly configurable. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go. Uh, okay, uh, B will be kind of the components of genomes. So how genomes are basically structured and organized. Uh, from that, we're gonna get into types of genetic variation. So SNPs and indels, and then larval structure variation. Uh, I'll explain what these are as we go, but I think it's important to just have an understanding of the kinds of variation we're trying to discover with genome sequence data uh, before you get there. So you know what you're looking at when you do get there. So we'll have some definitions and examples, things like this. Uh, from there, we're gonna get into uh, uh, sequencing technologies, including sort of a brief history of genome sequencing. So how it has been done uh, in the sort of pre-genomics era leading up to the early 2000s, and then how it's been done since then, which is almost exclusively Illumina, but also some of the long read technologies that have come online. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about raw sequence data. So what is a FASTQ file format? This is sort of the basic unit of data that you will get off the sequencer. Um, a little bit about sequence QC using a fast uh, program called FastQC. There are others, but I recommend this because it's easy and fast. Um, and then uh, some sequence repository, so where the data goes. And you might say, well, why do I have to know all this data stuff, right? I'm gonna be a data analyst. And I, I just wanna say that you should consider yourself very lucky if the people designing an experiment ask you for your input before they make the data. There is nothing more frustrating than a collaborator coming to you and saying, well, I made this data and I wanna answer this question. And you say, that's not how we should do this. We need different data. So uh, it's really good to have an understanding of how the data is made, where it's coming from, why you need this stuff so that you can communicate that to your more biological collaborators and make good data that you're happy with the whole time. Um, Okay, uh, so the definition, what's a genome? Uh, this term actually comes from the 1920s by a guy, H. Wrinkler, who I've never heard of in any other context, so I have no idea who this is. Uh, but the basic definition comes down to something like this. A genome are the complete set of chromosomal and extra chromosomal genes present in an organism, including a virus. So a virus has a genome. Some of you have been studying SARS-CoV-2. It's a very, very small, compact genome, but still well within the range of what we would call a genome. Okay, like I said, we're gonna immediately leave this presentation and go into uh, the UCSC genome browser for a quick demo of how this tool works and what you can do with it. Uh, before we get there, I'll just sort of emphasize one of the things I think is really powerful and useful, which is that you can immediately cross-reference lots and lots of data. So the, the browser already has um, tons of data sets uploaded to it, and you can just turn them on and off as different, what they call tracks. And I'll show you how to do that in just a second. Uh, the value of this is that, let's imagine you do a scan for selection and you find a gene that looks really promising. It is often extremely useful to zoom in on the browser, get an idea what's in that region of the genome around that gene and even within that gene, so that you can try to figure out uh, what might be going on there. And I know that that's a little open-ended and there's a, there's a reason for that as well. So if you go to genome.ucsc.edu, um, can I ask, are you able to follow along this? Are you seeing my browser switch tabs as I'm going? Somebody? Yes, sure. Perfect, okay. So you've all followed me to the genome browser then. <laughs> you can do this on your own computer if you like or you can just follow along here, it's okay. Um, but basically, you've gotten to this portal, genome.ucsc.edu. Um, it actually does a bunch of different things. We're going to click this first option, which is Genome Browser. Okay, and when we get into that, they have this really nice graphic on the side that shows you all the different organisms whose genomes they're currently hosting in their sort of standard genome browser. So it goes, you know, human, gym, bonobo, gorilla, et cetera, so primates, monkeys, et cetera, um, down to all kinds of other things, mice, it's going on, still in mammals, but down here you get down to, you know, uh, reptiles, alligators, chickens, birds, etc. all sorts of fun stuff. Um, so we'll start with human. I think it's by far the most commonly used version of this. And if you wanna search around the human genome browser, you just click the little human face here, or you can set it here, right? So you can also select your human assembly over there. Um, and let's go to a gene. So for example, we'll go to a gene that most organisms have. It's called ADH. 
So if you type that in, it'll give you all the possible hits. We'll go to ADH1A because it's the first one. And we hit go. And it's going to pull that up, uh, hopefully, relatively quickly here, in what's called a genome browser session. So what's going on here is, across the top, it's showing you the position on this chromosome, right? So we're in chromosome 4. You can see this here. Um, somewhere between 99 million to 176,000 and 99 million to 190,000. So this chunk of the genome here, and you can see the coordinates along the top as well. And then everything in the genome browser is displayed in the genome coordinates. It's the idea being that the genome is kind of your map and everything is laid on top of that map for where it is. Um, you'll see there's a whole bunch of different, uh, what's called tracks, right? When I'm highlighting the track or a gene track, and if you go down, you'll see a bunch of others. And what's going on for these genes at the top is these regions here, these black boxes are called exons, right? It's the expressed part of the gene, where an intron would be this dashed line. And what that means is that this whole thing uh, is transcribed into mRNA as a gene, but then these little intronic regions are spliced out of the final transcript. So they're not a part of the protein, but they are transcribed to RNA. Um, and so that's, uh, something I just want you to point out now, because if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see other things in here. Like for example, this is your conservation across hundred vertebrates track. You can see that most of this conservation is not very high, right? Zero would be the genome wide average level of genetic conservation between the human genome aligned to all other mammalian genomes that we have, or vertebrate genomes in this case, sorry. Uh, what you can see is that there really isn't a lot of conservation. In fact, most of the genome looks uh, basically random with respect to the rest, except if you go into these regions where the exons are, where you see quite a lot of conservation. So that's because these are genic sequences and purifying selection has probably uh, done its job and removed many, many mutations that have arisen in these sequences to maintain the protein sequence. Um, but the strength of selection to maintain an intron is much weaker. So a deleterious mutation can arise here, it doesn't affect the protein, and natural selection doesn't do anything. And you can see the same sort of thing again if you go down a little further into the you know, human, mouse, dog, et cetera. Um, these are all other mammalian genomes aligned to the human genome, where a big chunk in black would indicate that there is sequence conservation, and these sections in between indicate that there is no alignment between those genomes at all. So for example, chicken, aligned to human has a lot of stuff missing, which probably isn't all that surprising to you. Chickens are birds. They are many, many hundreds of millions of years divergent from humans. So we would expect this. But again, it conserves the exonic regions. Okay. At the bottom here, you'll see uh, something I often find extremely useful. And I mentioned this on the first day, and I'm going to reiterate now because I think it's tremendously important. Um, this is a track summarizing all the repeats, re elements found in this section of the genome. So what that means is these are chunks of the genome that uh, are identical or very, very similar in sequence to another part of the genome. And there's a lot of ways these arise, uh, and I'll talk about the specific biolog biological, biological, biological mechanism is these are often the sections that don't have sequence conservation. So for example, this little section here is a, probably a transposable element. In fact, it's a sign. And you can see that it isn't present in any of the other genomes in this region. Okay, um, before we go on from here, I'll just say you can configure these tracks. So there's a very good chance yours actually looks a little different from mine if you've navigated to this page as well. And the reason it looks different is that I've messed with my browser. So there's certain tracks it remembers I want to see, uh, and you may not get exactly the same set of tracks. And if you want to turn on different tracks, uh, different information, you go to these sections, um, and you can, you can amplify, you can delete, you can remove. In this case, I'm saying turn off that track, right, by hitting hide. Um, usually you're gonna wanna hit either dense or pack when you open them because the full track tends to be enormous and not very useful. But for example, we can go down and we'll say, um, maybe we'll turn on the CPG Islands section, right? All right, if we hit refresh now, It'll pull up that session having added this new track. I believe it will be down at the bottom, CPG Islands. Is anyone? Hmm. Okay, maybe it's not here. <laughs> maybe there are no CPG Islands in this section of the genome. I should have checked that before we did this. So um, don't worry too much, we'll figure this out. We can also turn on something that for sure will exist here. Let's imagine you wanted to zoom in on 
on a different uh, conservation track like your primates. We turn that one on, this will definitely show up. Um, you go down and you can see uh, conservation across 30-way uh, alignment of mammals, primates, etc., all down here. Um, so we've added quite a bit. You can also do nice things like drag tracks around. So if I want to cross-reference those gene models with conservation, we can actually just pull it up like this, highlight, pull it up. And finally, um, if you want to navigate around the genome, there's lots of little options along the top here. So zoom out, 10 times out would make it a much larger window I'm looking at. It takes a second to render. And you can see that now we're seeing quite a few genes. You see what's around ADH is other ADH genes. So this is a section of the genome that encodes, I don't know, five or six of these, uh, which is not particularly unusual. You often find uh, functionally related genes near each other. And if we do the same thing where we scroll down, let's look at this track here because this is what I'm gonna leave off on. Uh, you can see that um, something like 30 to 50% of this region has repetitive elements in it, right? If you look at all these little sections here, all these black boxes. It indicates a big chunk of this genome is repetitive elements in and around this gene, particularly this little section here, which are intronic in all the genes around it. Okay, uh, let's look at something else though. So I think it's important to have a comparative approach for a lot of these things and think about how other genomes might look. Uh, we're gonna go back to the genome browser's main page and now click on fruit fly, right? So this is an organism I study quite a bit and, and know quite a bit about. It is also probably the best sequenced or among the best sequenced metazoan genome. So we really, really know what this genome looks like. If we hit, let's also go to ADH. So uh, ADH is a very conserved gene. The vast majority of mammals have a copy. It'll take you there. It's showing similar things, right? Now your functional, um, your conservation is relative to other Drosophila species, mosquito species, and a few further out. So bees, for example, is Apis mellifera down here. And you can see that uh, the same basic pattern holds up where the genic regions, these exons, again, protein coding regions, are extremely strongly conserved. And if we scroll down, I don't have this track on here, so let's scroll down to variation and repeats and turn on repeat, oh, it's already on. Mm, it's not where I think it should be. Ah, here it is, sorry. Uh, your repeat masker track is here. You can see that there's just one little repeat in this region. If we zoom out, bit, give it a second. It's 20 year old C code uh, that runs the entire browser. So I think it's maybe not all that shocking. It sometimes looks a little clunky, but um, it also runs, you know, uh, millions of requests a day. So it has to be, uh, it has to be something like this that's pretty stable and long, long maintained. Okay. Or not. Okay, there we go. All right. Same thing, so we've zoomed way out. We're seeing actually a pretty big chunk of the genome, it's 33 KB. And when you do that, and you look at your, your repeat masker track, this thing I'm highlighting now in green, you'll see that there's actually very few. It's maybe 5% of this genomic region. And the point of this whole section at the end here is just to emphasize one of the key differences between uh, human and fly, but also between many other organisms, which is the density of these repeat elements. And they're important for a whole bunch of reasons. So it's gonna come up again in the next lecture about genome assembly. And it's definitely gonna come up again uh, in the section about mapping reads to a reference genome. So the third lecture I do. Um, the reason is if you have a literally identical sequence, this sequence is literally identical to another somewhere else in your genome. And you have a short read that is exactly matches that sequence, then it can map to literally anywhere in your genome. And it also has important implications for genome assembly that we'll talk about when we get into De Bruyne graphs. Okay, so let's go back. Um, um, I'll also say, I won't, I won't show you right now, but I'll also say that uh, the genome browser, one of the key features that it has is that it's configurable. So if you come up with a statistic or you have a mapping you wanna look at in detail, it's actually really easy to create your own tracks using a term called a track hub. And when you do this, you're able, to, uh, you're able to just visualize your own data set against everything else simultaneously. And I know that 
Uh, a lot of people are, are dismissive of data visualization, but I actually find it to be one of the most important ways to inspect a data set. It tells you a lot about what's going on in your data very quickly in ways that is very hard to learn from any other format. So I, I highly recommend getting used to um, a browser type framework and learning to kind of click around and see stuff. Okay, so what's in a genome? So as I hinted at the beginning here and several times throughout, um, there's differences among genomes. So there's some amount of variation. So if we're, this is showing you just all the way down to E. coli, a bacteria up to human, um, the estimated genome size in base pairs. And you can see that this varies across about three orders of magnitude just in this comparison. And actually um, there are bacteria whose genome sizes are one or two orders of magnitude smaller than this as well. And so you would say that the total variation is five, six, seven orders of magnitude um, that we typically see. So there's a lot, a lot of difference in genome size. And some of that's related to the chromosome number, although I think it's worth pointing out that in metazoans, uh, this isn't that different, right? So we're going from eight to about 46. Uh, it's really, really not that different across it. So probably chromosome number isn't the main explanation. Um, and actually the gene number is not all that different either, right? The only thing that's a real big outlier here is yeast or the bacteria again, but even they are only one order of magnitude smaller in number of genes. So this isn't the big difference, although there is quite a lot of variation. And so um, we'll talk just a little more about the structure of some other genomes you might be less familiar with and then talk about why they're different. So uh, many of you have uh, undoubtedly seen bacterial you know, genomes in high school biology classes, just to quickly reiterate. The main difference is that rather than a set of linear chromosomes, you have a single circular chromosome, um, but you also typically have plasmids. And these are other littler circular chromosomes that contain non-essential genes that are shared very quickly between bacterial strains. Um, they're super important because uh, the origin of, of lots of um, antibiotic resistance among bacterial strains tends to be plasmids they got from other bacteria that had already evolved resistance. Um, um, another kind of genome that you can often see, just to give you an appreciation for the variation in genome structure and size, are viral genomes. And these can be all kinds of things, right? So um, they can be double-strand DNA, just like metazoan genomes, like your and my genome. Sometimes they're single-stranded DNA, uh, double-stranded RNA, and even single-stranded RNA. Um, and so that the last one there is what SARS-CoV-2 is, for example. It's a plus-stranded RNA virus, which means that it's um, a single strand of RNA that encodes genes on the strand that it that is the coding frame. Um, and these often contain just a handful of genes. So you might imagine there's as few as, as eight in some cases and maybe less. SARS-CoV-2 is a few more. Um, we'll show that as an example really quickly. Um, so here is a schematic of SARS-CoV-2, and this is a, gra a screen grab from the genome browser, just showing you uh, the gene model. So where we think genes are across this genome. And as you can see, there is, I don't know, maybe 12 total proteins this entire genome codes for. Uh, many of them are very small, and we're not even totally sure what some do, but um, some of the more important ones are highlighted here. So for example, the spike protein here, tremendously important. It's out in this region here, this S protein. Um, that's what it's using to interact with the host genome. Uh, and there's also quite a few others, the membrane proteins, nucleocapsid. Uh, the point is uh, SARS-CoV-2 only encodes these 12 genes because that's all it needs to do what it does. Uh, whereas a human has a much more complex developmental process, has quite a lot more genes that's, that are involved in that process. And so uh, you, can, you can think of this as kind of a use it or lose it type thing where most organisms don't encode genes that don't do something, or at least those genes don't last very long when they do. Okay. Okay. I mentioned this on the first day. I think I'm going to reiterate now, and I also talked about this a little earlier. What's the big difference uh, between metazoan genomes? The big difference is these things called transposable elements. And what these are, are selfish DNA elements that are really, really good at propagating themselves across the genome. The idea is uh, their goal is to make more of themselves. Actually, that's the goal of everything in evolution, <laughs> but uh, that's also the goal of transposons, is to make more copies of themselves across the genome so that they're able to make more transposons. Um, and uh, what you can, there's actually a couple different flavors. This, the differences between them are not that important. The only thing that really matters here is uh, this on the, through an RNA intermediate before being reverse transcribed back into DNA inserted into the genome. Uh, 
uh, DNA transposons actually just cut out DNA and then reinsert that DNA directly back into the genome. But what this will do is create identical copies of this exact same sequence uh, at sites across the entire genome. And so if you look at the human genome, for example, something like 50 to 60-ish percent of the DNA in the human genome is a recent, uh, relatively recent consequence of uh, transposable elements. So transposons accumulate really quickly and they can really junk up genomes very fast. Oh. Okay. Um, so ag again, this is gonna become incredibly important when we start thinking about genome assembly problems where repeats are sort of the big issue of genome assembly have been for years. Uh, we're starting to resolve these things, but there's still some challenging sections. Uh, and of course, for read mapping, repeats matter tremendously as well, because like I said earlier, you just can't be sure where your read goes. Okay. Um, we'll talk a little about the broad scale structure of genomes. So uh, your a chromosome typically looks something like this. Um, they're not always exactly like this, but just so you have an idea of what they can be like. And again, this is in a metazoan, right? A bacteria would be circular and a virus could be kind of anything, but in a metazoan, so that would be plants, animals, uh, fungi, things like this. Uh, there's heterochromatin out at the edges. They tend, it tends to stain dark when you do cytogenetics. And what it is is condensed regions, um, uh, typically silenced, so they're not transcribing genes. They tend to be gene poor. Uh, so they're regions of the genome that have very, very little um, you know, coding density. So they're not making a lot of transcripts. And they tend to be located in centromeric regions, so around this little bit here in the middle, and on the tips, the telomeres out here. On the other hand, you've got uh, this light section here and here that's called your euchromatin. Actually, that's what the vast majority of people are really studying when they say they're doing population genetics or any kind of genomics. They're studying euchromatic regions of the genome. And the reason for that is that it has a lot of genes, uh, which tends to mean it's unique sequence, it's highly mappable. And we have an idea what those genes might do, right? They are genes, so we have some idea what the transcripts are, we have an idea what the protein is. There's kind of a lot more information often about these regions of the genome. And so that, that's mostly what you're gonna focus on when you do these kinds of analyses. But I think it's worth understanding why when you get to the middle of a chromosome, why do none of my reads map? Well, they don't map because it's a giant pile of repeats and we have no idea where the reads go and so we ignore those sections. Um, so when you look at a plot of coverage across your chromosome, you should not be surprised when the edges, the telomeres and the centromeres uh, don't show any coverage at all. You just don't get reads there. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little about just formally defining types of genetic variation. I'm hoping all of you are already familiar uh, with a couple of the first ones here, but we'll just say it for completeness. Uh, you've heard the term SNP or single nucleotide polymorphism. And what that would be is if I was comparing two or more chromosomes, it's a site where the sequence is clearly homologous, right? So it matches CTA, TA, et cetera. Um, but you see this one position here where there's a difference. G and C don't match. That would be a SNP where either the G has substituted a C or vice versa. Uh, and these are actually the most common uh, type of genetic variation to study in population genetics. In fact, we often throw out basically all other variation except SNPs uh, because for one thing, they're easily discoverable, right? The, the section of the genome is very similar, so it's pretty easy to find this one little difference. Uh, but for another thing, they're, they're fairly abundant. It's probably the most common type of at least small scale variation in genomes, so we see them a lot. And in fact, some of the earliest genome sequencing technologies didn't really sequence genomes at all. They simply looked for positions we knew had a SNP and tried to figure out which of the two alleles was present. So the G or the C in this case. Another really important kind of uh, genetic variation are indel polymorphisms. So these would be small, um, small uh, chunks of the genome where you either have a deletion or insertion. Um, and in this case, you don't know which of the two is ancestral. So it could either be a deletion in sample two or an insertion in sample one. But the important point is there's a section of the genome that clearly uh, is homologous here and here. And we have this little section in the center, the CAC, that doesn't match. You don't see it in sample two when you do in sample one. Okay. Um, and you might wonder, well, how is that different from this next example? Uh, and the truth is it kind of isn't, but it, it is. So and I know that's confusing, I'll explain. Um, so indels are typically fairly small. We usually define that to be a structural variant less than say a hundred base pairs. 
Um, macro deletions and duplications are something a little different. What these are are um, deletions or duplications of very large sections of the genome. So this might contain tens or hundreds of genes, and then it's completely deleted between the two chromosomes, right? And then the same thing in reverse here, where we have this duplicated area that gets duplicated in tandem. So you have one copy here and one copy here, um, where you have exactly uh, twice as many genes <laughs> because you've copied each of them over. Uh, these can be tremendously important and they're extremely common in larger genomes. So the human genome has quite a lot of tandem duplication. Um, and they're, all, they're also important because it's another type of repeat, right? So as, as unlike transposable elements that seem to kind of move everywhere around the genome, these typically duplicate in tandem. So you'll have one large chunk here near the centromere, which is this bit. And then you'll have a duplication right here, which is again, identical, but right next to the first bit. And the reason this is important is that it can be hard to figure out where my reads map in this case, right? So if I have this reference chunk here, I would have twice as many reads on this chromosome as this one because they come from both of these regions when I sample my, my sequence data. Okay. Okay. That's a very, very quick overview of the main types of genetic variation. There are actually many, many others, but I don't think that you need to know about them for the purposes of this class. I think this is probably sufficient. Uh, to just think about uh, transposable elements and other large duplications and deletions, um, indels and SNPs probably will be enough to have a pretty good idea of what you're looking at at the end of this. Um, but there's lots of other cool stuff, and I'll just I'll just plug this a little bit to say that uh, structural variation seems to be um, one of the big frontiers of understanding how the genome works. A lot a lot of the um, mutations we find that seem to do something tend to map to structural variants. Uh, which suggests that there's something really important about genome structure for determining phenotypic outcomes. I'm not saying this is universally true. There's, of course, many cases of adaptation that are SNPs uh, or indels, small indels. But structural variation seems to be one of the major frontiers, and it's something that we're beginning to be able to uh, study in pretty good detail because of the emergence of newer sequencing technologies and new methods for studying. Okay. So, uh, the sequencing technology. So I'm going to give you a quick, we'll call it a historical overview of some of the earlier sequencing technologies. Uh, you don't need to worry about these because very, very few people are doing this if anyone is still doing this. But I think it's kind of important to understand where you come from to understand how we got where we are and why the data works the way it does. So um, in the very first flavor of this, you did something called Sanger sequencing, uh, which would be amplifying a DNA sequence by bacterial cloning. And what I mean by that is you would shear DNA up this blue chunk here, and you would clone it. That is, you get it into a plasmid, which is a short, maybe 15 kb section of a genome, and you'd put that back in bacteria. And then you'd use those bacteria to grow up that plasmid, right? So as the bacteria multiply, they copy the plasmid. And so that section of DNA gets copied many times by the bacteria, right? So we didn't even have to do it ourselves. We got the bacteria to do it for us. Um, what you would do from there uh, is prime a sequence using a DNA primer. So how PCR uh, is essentially emerged from this sort of technology. The way this works is we know we have some sequence next to the chunk of DNA we care about. We know this because we clone that little section into, of DNA that we care about into a plasmid. If we know the sequence at the edge of the plasmids, we also know how to design a primer that is an oligonucleotide that's exactly complementary. So in this case, it's the reverse complement, and it would point toward the section of DNA we're trying to sequence, right? So it would sit out here. It's, you can tell that it's the reverse complement. So here's your five prime end, here's your three prime end, and you see that it's the exact opposite sequence. You do that so that it can bind to the genome pointing at the sequence you care about. Uh, and then you would amplify this. So we would use uh, what's called a polymerase, which is a protein that you your genome uses to copy itself uh, and basically every other genome uses to copy itself if it's DNA based. Um, and what they'll do is they'll just attach to this double strand section here and start filling in the nucleotides going out to the right. And in this case, you do four different reactions, right? So uh, in the first, you do a reaction where you include a little bit of this dideoxy ATP, dideoxy CTP, GTP, and TTP. So you have all four of the nucleotides here but when we have this dideoxy, what that means is that it's a stop, 
right? So the polymerase cannot incorporate another uh, nucleotide after it adds this one. So the vast majority of my mix are just normal, uh, nu uh, are just normal DNTPs or nucleotides, right? It's a mix of A's, C's, T's, and G's. The polymerase is adding them, but every now and again, it adds a stop. When it adds a stop uh, in the A reaction, we can be sure that that particular sequence stopped at A, for example. If it adds a stop during the C reaction, we can be sure it stopped at C, G, and T, right? So the idea is um, if I get a sequence of a very specific length, so this would be the primer length plus two, um, I can be sure there's a C at that second position because my reaction stops at that C, whereas it doesn't for the others. And so what you can do then is load each of these into an agarose gel and run them out. And the length of each of these tells you something about, uh, about where each of those or these variants occur across this genome. So you can sequence up to a few hundred base pairs at a time using this, if you're lucky, uh, often much less. I am fortunate enough, I never had to do this. I came into biology just after this was kind of no longer a thing. Uh, and it's, it's very lucky. But um, the way you read this, as I mentioned, is, is you run them out on a gel, right? So this would be your G reaction, your C reaction, your A reaction, and T reaction. And each of the, remember, each of those reactions stop at an A, at a T, at a G, at a C. And so if you kind of just stare across each of these lines, this first one must be an A, that's where all of them stopped, must be a T, must be a G, must be a C, et cetera. So, right, you're getting all, you're able to read down because you see where each of these four different reactions stop while going across this sequence. So the point here is that this is slow. This is laborious. Someone has to stare at this gel, and it's not always as clean as this gel is. Often your gel image is, is fuzzy, or you have a variant in the sequence you amplified such that there would be both an A and a T. It's very, very hard to use this kind of information uh, well, and it certainly is not a genomic technology because it just cannot scale to whole genomes or anywhere near that. Um, okay. So it's, it's kind of a terrible way to do this sort of thing, but it was the first thing we had. And so since then, there's been quite a few uh, new ways of thinking about these kinds of things that we're, um, that we're working on, and we'll get into those now. So the, the first major development, this is uh, an ABI sequencer. Um, what that basically means is it's the very first genomic instrument for sequencing. So these are the first ones used to sequence the human genome and the fly genome, uh, and, and they're much easier to use. And the reason is that rather than terminating with um, a, a, a single dideoxy C and running this out on a gel, you can now terminate your reaction uh, with a unique fluorescent label. So right, each G, for example, uh, in this case, has this brownish label. Each T has this red label. Each A has a green label. And so when they stop and you run this past a laser in a capillary, the length of time it takes to get to a given fluorescent signal tells you uh, what position you're at, and, you, and the signal that you get tells you what the base pair is. So at position 250 here, our laser only returned to blue, and you can see that we've got, we're pretty clearly having a C at that position right there. Um, so that's the kind of thing <coughs> that you would be doing. And the important point about this is that it could be automated uh, fairly easily such that rather than stare at a gel forever, uh, it was possible to get this, this feedback from a sequencer uh, very quickly and, and get automated output, right? I could tell what the sequence was just based on the trees. Okay. Uh, and using this kind of approach, you could do sequencing up to somewhere in the range of a thousand base pairs at a time, uh, and which would be, you know, a big advance at the time, but of course is, is a limiting reagent today. Okay. But this is slow, right? So if each reaction was a thousand base pairs um, and your human genome is uh, 3.2 billion base pairs, then you would need a minimum of 3.2 million reactions uh, to do this. But obviously you would need much more because you would want them to overlap and you couldn't be sure you sampled everything. You can't perfectly tile the genome. So it's gonna take quite a lot to do that. And that it's an amazing feat of engineering that this is more or less, um, with additional automation and parallelization, this is how the human genome was sequenced via a shotgun approach using ABI sequencers um, originally. But this is all changing, right? So I wanna move into the newer technologies which are uh, much more important to you because of the ones you will actually use in your career, uh, hopefully. 
Um, but the, this is all changed, right? So the cost per genome, this, this figure is actually well out of date, but I can't find a more updated version very easily. Uh, the cost per genome goes down, right? So back in uh, at the very beginning here, which would be 01-ish, 02, so the early 2000s, you're talking about you know, a $100 million genome. And then there's been a few major advances. So Moore's law would be, uh, it's a law of computing. Uh, hopefully you all are familiar with it, but it basically describes the rate that we think costs should decrease uh, relative to uh, the increase in, in sequencing technology. So in this case, what we're showing you is the cost per genome. So we fixed how much sequencing and we're just asking uh, how much does the cost decrease to make that genome? And so if we were about $100 million uh, back at the beginning of this, kind of follows the line for a while, but then around here, it changes completely, 07, 08, and dives down. It's actually gone way, way down to the point that you can do a human genome for about $1,000 today. Uh, and the reason for that is basically that Illumina sequencers became available right around here and completely revolutionized the way we were getting these data. Um, so it's the main driver. This is Illumina machines. Right. If you're showing you how many human genomes you can sequence annually on one of these uh, or using these, um, you'll see that the answer back in 98 on an ABI was, you know, one ish. Then a genome analyzer became available as the first Illumina machine. Uh, this also is out of date a little bit. The high seq X isn't even the, the latest and greatest. People are now using what's called a Nova seq uh, fairly regularly, which can produce maybe five or six times as much data as this even. So the, the scale of Illumina sequencing has gone up and up and up because it's so massively parallelizable. That is, you can sequence tons and tons and tons of different reads uh, all at the same time very, very quickly. Okay. Okay. All of that got you to today, hopefully, with sequencing technologies. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about uh, sequencing. I'm going to focus on this mostly because uh, the bulk of the data that you'll analyze, at least in the short term, will be Illumina. Uh, that is changing. People are, uh, you know, there's newer, better stuff coming out all the time, but it still seems to be the main workhorse for most genome sequencing that's going on. And I think it's certainly going to be the workhorse for most population genetics where you already have a nice reference genome and you're just trying to discover variation in other individuals relative to that reference. So the way this works is, uh, <clears throat> sorry, you start with your genomic DNA up here and you shear it. Uh, and when I say shear, I mean literally cut it. Uh, you can do this a couple different ways, but the most common would be a type of sonication, which is basically blasting sound waves, a little glass, little glass, glass vial, glass vial. That, and we have some really, really precise ways of doing this now. And it's, uh, that's actually been one of the major advances that has made this so easy, easily done and reproducible. After that, you do a type of ligation. So uh, you will add on sequences of a known of a known sequence, right? So these red chunks here are what's called an adapter. And the reason you wanna do that is uh, when you sequence a genome, you have no idea what's gonna be in this blue DNA, but you wanna be able to amplify it using that thing we talked about earlier, which is PCR. And so you need to be able to bind a primer. And the only way we're gonna be able to do that for each molecule is if we add a sequence that we know what the sequence is, so we can design a primer that's complementary to that sequence. And actually for Illumina sequencing, it's even more important. At the end of this though, uh, you'll do some PCR to grow the library up a little bit. And then finally, it can be sequenced. So uh, what's gonna happen is you'll attach your molecules to what's called a flow cell. So these are loaded onto the flow cell by your skilled molecular biology technician, hopefully. Um, and they'll bind to those complementary sequences. So remember out here in the blue and the purple up here are adapter sequences, right? So they're a sequence that I have ligated to my DNA that I know exactly what the sequence is. And my flow cell is made up of little oligonucleotides that match that blue chunk or that purple chunk. Uh, we'll get to that in a second, but for now they match the blue chunk, which means the DNA can hybridize so it can get stuck in a spot because it has match this reverse complement to this blue section here. And it's just sticking up like this, right? So here's my, my single strand DNA molecule sticking up. Then uh, we're gonna bridge them over so that both ends are contacting the surface, right? So this purple will find its uh, reverse complement sequence also on this flow cell. And you'll have this bridge here, right? That's why it's called bridge amplification. 
Then um, remember, we're already attached to a sequence uh, that is the reverse complement, and this little section is double stranded. So a polymerase can come in and it can grow it, right? So this bridge will copy itself uh, back and forth many times, right? So it makes a copy this way, and then it's able to prime off that new copy and go back this way, and then back this way, and then back this way. And at the end, you'll have what's called a cluster. And what these are are a ton of molecules, so a few hundred, that are all descendant from a single original molecule, so this one that bound to the flow cell and has been copied many times using bridge amplification. The reason that's important is, uh, well, actually it'll become obvious in a second, I'll emphasize this, but um, you have many, many clusters. Okay, so, and what you finally do at the end of this thing uh, is sequence, right? So I've grown a big cluster of uh, DNA molecules with specific sequences I've added to the end that I know exactly what they are using adapters and some sequence in the middle that I wanna know what it is, but I've copied it many, many times. Now, what we're gonna do is sequence in what's called cycles. The idea is I'll add a uh, thymine, right? Or, uh, or whatever the reverse complement base of the actual sequence is here. Um, and each of these, as I add them, is tagged with a fluorescent uh, marker, right? So T will have its own fluorescent marker, uh, A, C, and G will have their own fluorescent markers. Um, it, but that fluorescent signal is very, very weak. So the reason that you need to grow your cluster and have hundreds of these sequences all together is that we want to see T, uh, this T bound to hundreds of different copies of the same molecule. So you have a much stronger fluorescent signal. At the end of this, uh, you take a photo. And that photo is the actual raw analysis unit for these sorts of things. So in the, it, you, what you'll basically see is a little image, a point of light, corresponding to the nucleotide that's been added to that site in the last cycle. Um, the end of that, you reverse the terminator. So there is a section here causing this to not be able to add the next nucleotide. And you go back to step one. So that's your cycle, right? I add my fluorescent marker, I take a photo, I remove the terminator, wash everything away, and then I add the next nucleotide. You can do this you know, hundreds of times in a row. Um, just keep doing that over and over again. And as I said, at the end, your raw analysis unit is something like this. It's a picture of a bunch of points of light. So if we're following this cluster through it, you'll see it goes T, G, C, T, A, C, right? Because the fluorescence is blue, yellow, orange, bluish, et cetera, right? So you can see that uh, by growing these and adding these fluorescent nucleotides, we can, we can actually track many clusters, right? And so that's the actual advantage of the way we're doing this with Illumina is that you can track um, in parallel with the same number of cycles, many, many, many clusters all at once on your flow cell. And these images are a little misleading, right? You think, oh, I could just pick them out. There's 10 of them or whatever. Uh, but what's actually happening is each flow cell may have many billions of these clusters at one time, right? And so uh, they're, they're extremely parallel uh, to the point where you can sequence a human genome uh, you know, on one of these, you can sequence many human genomes on a single sequencing run very, very easily. Um, okay, uh, one other important uh, feature to know about for Illumina data <coughs> is that you will often have uh, different flavors of reads, right? So uh, this is becoming less common now, but for a long time, you could only get single end reads where uh, we'd only read from the five prime end of the molecule into the unique DNA sequence here, right? So what you get out of that is a 50 or 100 base pair or 150 base pair single end sequence, so just a chunk of sequence. Um, a, big a big advancement that came out back in about 2010 and is by far the most common way to sequence genomes now is using what's called paired end reads. And what that means is you, uh, we'll first sequence off one end of the molecule and then uh, we'll sequence off the, the other end of the reverse complement of that molecule, right? So you can actually read both sides of a given sequence. And so the really big advantage of this is that now I know that 150 base pairs came from this section of the genome and 150 base pairs came from somewhere very nearby in the genome. And I even know their orientation, right? In this case, they should be pointing at each other because I've read in from the edges. And this can be really, really valuable because if nothing else, you've basically doubled your read length for alignment. So you can much more precisely map your reads often using paired end sequencing. 
but it can also tell you other interesting things that we'll get into in, in genome assembly and other downstream parts, uses of this technology. Okay. Uh, some of the common read lengths you'll see, uh, it'll typically be 50, 100, or 150 base pair reads. Um, that's actually, this slide is also out of date. Uh, the, the NovaSeq now does 250 base pair paired end reads fairly consistently. And I think um, at least for genome assembly and, and variation calling, people often go for the longest reads because it tends to be the, the cheapest per unit of information per base pair sequenced. Longer reads tend to get you a lot more. Um, and this seems really short, right? So even 250 base pairs is pretty short when you consider that a, a chromosome can easily be hundreds of millions of base pairs. So you might say, well, how the heck is this working? Um, well, the reason this works, I think I've, I mentioned this earlier, but I think it's worth reiterating quite a bit, is that the, the yields are incredible, right? So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, uh, there's about, um, you can get something like 400 million reads or read pairs off a single lane of a high seq 4,000. Um, and, uh, and you can imagine that's quite a lot, right? So if we do this, we do some basic math on this, assume every read is mappable, et cetera. You can think about what your expected coverage might be. And it's never as high as you think it will be, but I think it's worth knowing about these kinds of calculations because as I said, someday you as a dry lab person may be asked to help design a sequencing experiment. And it's useful to think about how much data I want to get. <laughs> so I know what I'm looking at. Um, so in this case, you might say, well, we have 400 million reads that come off of our sequencer. Uh, each of those is maybe 300 base pairs of sequence, right? So if you have 150 base pair paired end reads, you can think of each of those read pairs as 300 base pairs. That would, in the end, you'd have something like 120 billion base pairs of sequence data from a single lane. Um, if you divide that by the human genome size, assuming your each of these bases is sampled uniformly at random across this genome, you'd get an idea of about, you'd get something like 37x coverage. That is a single site in the human genome would have on average 37 and a half reads stacked up at that site after aligning them. So that's, that's very, very good coverage. That'd be quite a lot for most applications, at least for calling genetic variation, like SNPs and indels, you would probably be fine. Um, which is a really, really uh, incredible thing that's happening right now because you can buy one lane of sequencing like this for something in the range of a thousand US dollars. So it's becoming in increasingly cost effective. And I think in the very near future, it will become much, much less. So, uh, you know, it's, the data is rarely the main limitation for discovery today, uh, especially when you consider just how much data has already been generated and how easy it is to make more data. Um, so, I will quickly talk a little bit about some of the newer sequencing technologies that are coming online and have uh, seemed to be really important. Um, the, excuse me, the first is gonna be a passer. So um, the way that these work is actually kind of similar to Illumina. It's, the idea is it's still sequencing by synthesis. So the idea here is that you are uh, basically figuring out what your DNA section is by synthesizing it again and having some readout as you go. Uh, so the same sort of thing works here. You'll generate your sequence. In this case, um, it's, it's a double strand molecule with uh, some length, a few thousand base pairs potentially. You ligate on what's called a smart bell adapter, uh, but what it really is is just a hairpin. So what that means is that there's a stem that's complementary. They don't show that here, but it's true. Uh, and then there's a section that isn't complementary out here at the edges. And what that means is you've basically made a big circle, right? You can follow this thing all the way around because, you know, if this is your uh, five and this is your three, five prime to three prime back around, five prime to three prime back around, which is incredibly advantageous for sequencing because now um, we can sequence the same molecule several times over, right? So I keep going around this molecule and I'll say, oh, I've read the blue, the light blue section. I read the dark blue section, which is the reverse complement. Light blue again, dark blue again. And so at the end of this, when you want to analyze your data, you'll say, oh, I have this, I have this adapter sequence here. I know these red things I don't care about because I've already read them before. But we also have these little light blue and dark blue sections that we'll process, we'll stack on top of each other and we'll call a consensus. This is a circular consensus sequence. 
And I don't think I mentioned this, so I'll just say it now. The way this is working, the way it can read out base pairs as it goes around this, uh, this circle is that they are, they're fluorescent, right? So they're, they're showing you some amount of fluorescence, um, but they're not terminators. So it doesn't stop the reaction, it just keeps going. So this is sort of a real-time video. As the polymerase moves around the circle, you're seeing it just flash lights as it goes, right? So it'll flash um, a specific color for A, C's, T's, or G's. And, it's, and the video is trying to record that information on the fly. <coughs> um, the latest stuff with this has become really incredible. So the first versions of PacBio uh, were, we call it PacBio, it's Pacific Biosciences or long, uh, type of long read technology. The first version of PacBio um, really wasn't all that appealing. And the, the reason it wasn't that appealing was you couldn't get a lot of data and it was extremely error prone, right? So even having read this molecule twice, we just weren't very good at reading the sequence data in the first place. And so at the end, you'd have a molecule, uh, a circularized consensus sequence that might still have, uh, you know, 10% errors or more. So it really wasn't that valuable for um, accurate sequence data. What people were using it for at the time and actually continue to use it for was the read length. So this could be uh, many thousands to tens of thousands of base pairs long. And so as opposed to Illumina, which has this really, really kind of restricted length, PacBio is enormous, right? And so there's lots of advantages of that. And we'll talk about those tomorrow as a part of the genome assembly section where we think about what long reads can do for us and how we can use long reads in ways, <coughs> excuse me, that are a little different. Okay. Okay. Um, another, uh, sorry, there's one more thing I intended to say about that. So other really important thing about this. Uh, the newer stuff, right? So there was this 10% error rate. There's something new that's come out uh, about a year ago now. It's called HIFI, H-I-F-I. And what these are is the same thing, except uh, somebody had the brilliant idea of what if we just let the video run longer? So rather than stopping it at some point, we just let the polymerase keep going around this circle for as long as it can. Um, and what that did for us was it allowed the the raw long read to be incredibly wrong, right? So it might read this light blue and dark blue section a hundred times each. So they, they read the same thing over and over and over and over again. When you stack them all up at the end, if your errors are independent and random, uh, you can be pretty sure that you got the right sequence out of this thing, right? Because there's just no way that you'd see the same error a hundred times if they really are independent and random. And in fact, that seems to have been true, right? So I've downloaded and I've even made some of this data and it's amazing, right? It looks uh, as accurate as, uh, as Illumina data, except it's 20 KB long, <laughs> 20,000 base pairs long. So when you align it to the genome and you see absolutely no differences or very, very few, uh, you become incredibly confident that the few differences you do see probably are really genetic variants. And it's, it's a pretty incredible thing that's come online recently. And it's, it's been really important for genome assembly. There's lots and lots of development of algorithms to use that data efficiently and quickly. Uh, which again, we'll talk about tomorrow, uh, but it's also gonna be important for discovering structural variation and genotyping genetic variation in individuals. Okay. Um, the other type of sequencing technology that I'm uh, contractually obligated to talk about because uh, UC Santa Cruz holds uh, a lot of the patents for this technology and it's something that, that uh, we are incredibly proud of is called an Oxford nanopore sequencer. Uh, some of you may have seen one of these. I don't have an example because I'm at home, but it's a little device about the size of a cell phone and it can plug into a USB on basically any laptop and just stream sequence data onto it. So it's, it's a pretty incredible thing. People use them in the field. So they'll go into um, you know, random places of the world and they're able to sequence uh, at a particular site, right? So they're able to sequence uh, you know, in a forest, for example, without ever taking a sample out, you can just do it right there. And I think, uh, it's pretty clear that this technology has a lot of potential for very rapid sequencing turnaround. The library prep's pretty easy. You can do it anywhere. And so, for example, in the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak that's, you know, ongoing, uh, there's been an enormous use of this technology. So there's places uh, all over the world that have started using this stuff, and it's really, uh, it's really catching on. So we have sequence data coming in from Gabon, from, you know, South Africa, from Zambia. Uh, where people are using these to sequence uh, SARS-CoV-2 genomes uh, because you can do this in a location very, very quickly. <coughs> this is, of course, tremendously important for the scientific community um, 
because you can get immediate sort of real-time feedback about the viral genome across the world. Uh, and it's something that I think is one of the coolest frontiers of sequencing today is how quickly we can make uh, these information accessible. Okay, all of that is to say uh, it's cool and it's something that we're working on now. So what I'm actually showing you is a figure um, showing how you can do what's called direct RNA sequencing. Uh, which is one of the things that Oxford Nanovore can do that I think no one else can. Uh, the basic way this works is you extract your RNA and there's sort of a quirk of, of uh, metazoan transcription biology, which is that poly A tails get added to the ends of chromosomes. Um, and those, uh, those tails uh, have some length of A's, right? So just A's are added. Um, they tend to be 50 to say a couple hundred A's at a time. It varies a lot, so don't quote me on this, but something like that. The really nice thing about that is I now have a sequence that I know will be on every transcript that I care about. So all I have to do then is add in an adapter sequence which has this T on it, right? Because T will be the complement of A, so it pairs in the reverse fashion pointing in toward my molecule. And then uh, this, this T will get um, added to an adapter sequence and thrown into um, a nanopore. So the nanopore is going to uh, take in that adapter sequence, which is attached to a protein motor complex, and just read this RNA molecule through the pore all at once. Um, so it's actually a completely different way of sequencing than the other two, right? The, the other two are both sequencing by synthesis, right? You make the complement of the molecule you want to know about and sort of measure what you're making as you go. In this case, you don't make anything. You just feed your information through a little pore and that pore is measuring the current. Uh, so it's amount of electricity basically that's transmitting through this little site. And you get something like this out, which is a current trace. <coughs> and the important point about this is that each sequence that you could feed through will tend to have its own uh, unique current. And so you can sort of read what's going through this based on how much current you're transmitting through that pore at a given time. And it goes very, very quickly, right? You'll read thousands of base pairs in about a second. And so you can read, uh, you can read quite a lot of data. The high th it's an incredibly high throughput process. Um, so uh, as I said, this is a, a figure from an RNA-seq version of this. I, I say that because it's kind of unique and interesting but the, this is often used for DNA sequencing as well. There's sort of no difference. You just attach an adapter using a different kind of ligation uh, that also has that protein motor complex and the same basic process works for that as well. Um, ONT also has extremely high error rates uh, compared to Illumina, right? So it's something like one in 10 to slightly higher sometimes. Uh, basis is an error. And in particular, it has a really high rate of what's called indel errors. So that would be little sections where bases are added or removed from a consensus sequence relative to the genome. So it, it has some important problems. The big advantage for genome sequencing is that you can make incredibly long molecules. So the, I believe the current record is a 2.2 million base pair molecule that was read in one shot through one pore. Uh, and so the fact that we can do things like that uh, means that genome assembly becomes a much easier task, even though the error rate is enormous, if you, really, if you actually read 2.2 million base pairs at a given time, uh, you can imagine that you've, you've read something like a 10th of a chromosome in some cases. So, so it becomes much easier to scaffold the rest of my chromosome out. Uh, you almost never see people sequence genomes purely with ONT or PacBio because the error rates are still high enough that there's no reason not to use Illumina data to go back and try to correct some of those errors as you go. Okay. So I'm gonna introduce some really important terminology that I'm, I, I will certainly use and I suspect Torfin will use quite a bit as well. I'm gonna to try to define these terms a little bit more uh, specifically than you often see in the literature and I'll explain what that confusion is right now. Um, so uh, I said earlier, how many times you'd cover a genome, right? Essentially the question there is um, how many times or how many reads would I have aligned at a given site in the genome? So if we go to this site in my reference genome, you'll see your coverage is 5x, right? There's five different reads that all overlap that one position. Other sites are down at 1x. We're often reporting uh, the depth of coverage. So people sometimes abbreviate this as just depth, which is fine by me. And that will typically be the mean. If you took all the sites across your reference genome, it's the mean number of reads at a given position. 
It's sometimes reported as the median as well. They're similar, but not the same, uh, so check. Okay, the other way people use the term coverage, so they, they often use this word coverage interchangeably, and that's where a lot of confusion comes from when reading the literature in my experience. So that's why I'm trying to define this very clearly for you so that when I use one or the other, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, if your depth of coverage is how many reads are at a site, your breadth of coverage, which again is often just said as coverage, would be uh, what proportion of sites in the genome or what percent of sites in the genome do I have at least one read or more that cover that position, right? So in this genome, the vast majority of sites uh, have at least one read, although you can see the edges here don't seem to have a read, but you'd be getting toward a proportion of sites or toward a breadth of coverage of one, um, which, is, which is ideal, right? You'd like to cover your whole genome. As I said earlier, there's lots of different reasons that different parts can't be sequenced or can't be assembled or accurately aligned. So you almost no one, actually no one ever really gets to depth of, or breadth of coverage of one, but you can get pretty close in some genomes, like, like for example, SARS-CoV-2 or bacterial genomes, which have very few repeats and tend to be quite small, it gets possible to get pretty close to breadth of coverage of one. So again, depth of coverage, we're gonna define that for my purposes here as the mean number of reads uh, at the average site across the reference genome. And your breadth of coverage will be the proportion of sites across the reference that have some amount of reads aligned at those sites. Okay. Cool. I uh, definitely need a short break here. So this might take slightly more than 10 minutes. I'm going to send you all to breakout style rooms as we go. Um, the What I'm going to send you off with are these questions here. Uh, I know that there's no good way to transmit these questions to you in the breakout rooms. So. Uh, a suggestion that I find has worked really well for me is to just take a screenshot of this slide right now. So I'll give you all a second to do that. Please uh, grab a quick screenshot. Um, some of these questions are easier than others. That's kind of the point. Uh, it's just to make you think a little bit about this. If you think you know the answer immediately, maybe let somebody else in the group who, who knows a little bit less about this try to work on it. Don't just tell them immediately the answer. So think about it a little bit, uh, then discuss. But the important point here is to start thinking about how reads uh, come from a genome and what they tell you about that genome in very broad strokes. All right, looks like just about everybody has made it back. Does anybody want to share some answers with us? I'll also share the screen here. So. Um, I can call on people, but I'd really prefer if somebody just speak up. Um, who has an idea? The first one hopefully was pretty easy. Do you have an idea what the answer to this might be? Okay. <laughs> I do need to figure out who's in the room so I can call on people. Jim, you have to check people. The experience in online teaching taught everyone that it is like very unlikely to get an answer from uh, it is true. In the Zoom, in, in the Zoom meeting. It, it's long. true. It's actually the, the same as in um, as in in-person teaching. It's very hard to make people talk. So <laughs> let's do it. Uh, how about Anastasia Nikolaj? Uh, Anastasia. <laughs> Sorry. Well, there's two of you. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> um, Anastasia Sharova. How about that? Uh, so you chose the easy one. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about the first one. Um, I actually don't <laughs> because okay. I think I misunderstood something. That's okay. We'll do it together. It'll be great. Um, so this is our question, right? Something like that. Um, what you want to do here is, is think a little bit about uh, the total number of reads you're making or base pairs you're making. Uh, and then divide by your read pairs, right? So in other words, you wanna know how many reads I need to get to this target depth of a genome of this size. So the way I would do this is take my genome size, multiply it by my target depth. That's how many total base pairs I need to make. If you then divide that by the base pairs per read pair, right? So we have 150 base pair paired end Illumina reads, which would correspond to 300 base pairs in a given you know, pair of fragments. Uh, you would divide by this to get the total number of read pairs you need to make. And in this case, you get about 3.3 million total read pairs. 
Um, I want to emphasize that this is totally back of the envelope math. It doesn't actually work like this because some portion of your reads won't be alignable. Some portion of your reference genome, it will not be possible to align reads to. Uh, and often you have a sample that has some amount of bacterial contamination or something else on it. Any amount of other genomes that are in the tube also takes some of the reads. So that doesn't really work the way we think it does. <laughs> so, but I think it's useful to have a, an idea how to roughly approximate this kind of thing because as I said, as the dry lab person on some of these projects, there's a very good chance you'll be consulted and thinking about how many reads we should make uh, and, and how to go about generating these data, even though you won't be doing the molecular biology work for I think most of you probably. Cool. All right, um, let's go to the next one. I can do it too, uh, since it's easier than me trying to call on people whose names I can't pronounce. <laughs> so um, this is really a question to try to think about uh, what kind of distribution you would use to model your depths, right? So some of you that have that have a little bit more statistics training might have thought about this a little bit and said, well, um, if I'm sampling reads uh, uniformly at random uh, and each position in the genome is relatively rare per read because your genome is enormous and each read is relatively small, then you can probably use a Poisson distribution to model the depth. And in which case you really just need to come up with the 95% confidence interval for a Poisson distribution with mean 10. Uh, and if you, there's calculators online you can find for this or you can use actual explicit formulas, but the important point is you get something like five to 18 X would be your expectation. So 95% of sites would have coverage between five X and 18 X, right? So five reads on average per site to 18 reads on average per site. This is, I know I just did that, I'm specifically describing your depth of coverage here, just to be very clear, uh, not the coverage across the genome, depth of coverage at the 95% of sites in the middle of my depth distribution. All right, and the last one I think might've been the trickiest. It's to try to think a little bit about uh, what happens when your reference genome doesn't have the same variation as your sample. So um, I'll also do this one. In the future, I'll figure out how to cross-reference my breakout rooms while I have questions on slides. But uh, for now, you're basically imagining that you have an individual who's diploid. So they have two chromosomes and their chromosomes look like this, right? So one of their chromosomes has the normal number of copies, one copy. Uh, another chromosome actually has two copies in this given region, this big, large region of the genome. Excuse me, so, you're not sharing yep. screen right now. I'm not sharing my screen, so I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> and it took us that long to get there? Oh, man. All right. So thank you for letting me know. Um, I thought you were just talking about questions. You haven't I, you didn't this slide. No, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> so thank you, uh, whoever that was. Hopefully, I'm back to my screen now, and I've, I've regenerated. Um, yes, everyone can see something. Yes, now it's good. Um, Okay, thank you so much. Um, it's one of the greatest challenges of lecturing on Zoom, I find, is that I, I feel like I'm just screaming at nobody. Uh, so <laughs> hopefully uh, that wasn't totally useless. I'll repeat some of that to try to make it clear what I'm talking about here. So in the first question, the basic math that we're trying to do is genome size times target depth is basically the number of base pairs of sequence I need to make. If we then divide that by the number of base pairs you'll get per read pair, so in this case, it'd be 300 base pairs, you get about 3.3 million total reads. So it's just simple stoichiometry converting between base pairs of the genome, depth of coverage in the genome, and the number of base pairs I make. Um, as I said, you may want to know how to do these kinds of simple back of the envelope math type things because you will be asked to do them if you're designing experiments for sequencing. Um, okay, uh, so again, the idea behind this is use a Poisson distribution to think about modeling your depth distribution and your 95% confidence interval is gonna be something like uh, five reads on average per site to 18 reads on average per site. I do wanna emphasize that the Poisson distribution uh, has basically never been uh, the right answer. <laughs> so we all model it this way, we all use the Poisson, but in practice, uh, you never get a Poisson distribution. There's lots of reasons for that probably, um, and I won't, I won't talk about it in too much detail uh, why you can violate this model, but it is a really useful starting point to think about how you'd model your depth and think about how uh, the basic shape of your depth distribution ought to look. Okay. 
Okay, finally, um, this question, right? You basically have this karyotype on the left here, or on the right, sorry, uh, where this individual has two chromosomes. So imagine they have both of these. One of them matches the reference. That is, it only has one copy of this region. And the other one uh, is has a variation relative to the reference. And that variation is a duplication of a relatively large chunk of the genome. Um, so the question becomes, well, what is the expected depth of coverage in this region of the genome? If the genome-wide average is 10, and we assume that this duplication is, is pretty small relative to the total size of the genome, then you want to think, OK, um, as opposed to most of the genome, so for example, the top of this chromosome, where you have exactly one copy in the reference, and um, as you expect, your diploid individual has one copy on both their chromosomes, Clearly, the depth in this region should be expected to be 10 as well, right? Because your genome-wide average is 10, uh, and this has the same copy number as the rest of your genome, 10 is my answer. But if I go down here in this individual, I suddenly have more, right? More material. So if I sample my reads uniformly at random across these chromosomes and across this genome, I will actually sample this region of this individual uh, on this chromosome twice as frequently as this region because there's literally twice as, as much DNA corresponding to that region in the reference genome. So the expected coverage, again, assuming that this, this section is relatively small uh, compared to the whole genome that we got a 10x mean coverage on, your expected coverage here would be uh, 15x, right? Because you have one and a half copies of this relative to your reference genome across your two uh, diploid chromosomes in this individual sample. And so we'd expect to have higher coverage in this region. And if that region's big enough, or if your depth is high enough, your mean depth is high enough, this is actually one of the first ways people use to start finding these large macro duplications and macro deletions, right? So if you were to ask the opposite question, well, what happens when, for example, this individual on the right uh, has a deletion, right? So this whole blue section is gone. You would get uh, the same thing in reverse, which is a 5x expected coverage across that region. So this can be one of the useful tools we use to figure out when there's a region of the genome that doesn't appear to be well behaved and might be something we should flag because it doesn't, it's not making data consistent with our expectations compared to the rest of the genome. And in fact, uh, depth filters is one of the most common ways people filter alignments to remove potentially spurious genotypes from downstream analysis. Um, there's, of course, many, many others. I just like to throw this one out there because it can be explained simply and graphically. Okay. Um, I, quickly, I'm going to go through two other types of sequencing. So um, you just need to know about these. This isn't going to come up in any of the stuff I do downstream, but you will see this in papers you read. I think it's worth knowing about them. Uh, the first is RNA-seq. I talked about this a little bit in the context of ONT sequencers earlier on, and I'm gonna re-emphasize here. So um, you probably all are familiar with the central dogma of biology. That is, your genome is DNA. At some rate, it will make RNA molecules corresponding to proteins or genes. Those RNA molecules are then transcribed into, pro uh, translated, sorry, into proteins. Um, the idea here is that you go from DNA to RNA to protein, and it almost all information flows that way. So in this case, we're stopping at an intermediate step. We can't shotgun sequence proteins yet, or at least not well, um, but we can shotgun sequence RNA. But we're doing this by violating actually one of the central rules of the central dogma, which is that we take our RNA, and again, as I said earlier, it has this poly A tail in all metazoans. And so we can use a primer with poly T's, to prime this for what's called reverse transcription. So what we do is we, we make what's called cDNA synthesis, which is we go backwards. We go from RNA back to DNA, and then we amplify that DNA. And after you've done that, you can make a sequencing library just like every other Illumina library that you've ever made, right? You attach, you ligate your adapters onto this thing, uh, you amplify this, and you throw it on a flow cell and sequence. Um, okay, why do we care about this? Well, we care about it uh, because it tells us what parts of the genome are being transcribed at a given time, right? And so if we were to take all of our reads and align them back to the genome, uh, first of all, you should see that they mostly or exclusively align to genes, right? So if A, B, C, D, and E are all genes and these sections in between are intergenic, you see that all of my RNA-seq reads 
are going to these genes because those are the sections of the genome that are being transcribed from DNA to RNA. Um, once we do that, uh, we can actually use this to measure gene expression, right? So one thing you'll see very quickly here is that A and C, these two genes, seem to be expressed at a much higher level than B, D, and E, right? You've got much lower expression levels in those uh, than you have in A and C. And so uh, what, this, um, what this can do is it can tell us what's on at a given time in a genome. And it's really important for understanding development, for understanding uh, local adaptation, because uh, often gene expression is a really big component of adaptation. And it's really important just for annotating your genome, right? Like you need to be able to figure out what genes there are uh, when you make a new genome. And often RNA-seq is the way to do that. Um, another technology you'll probably hear about because it's becoming uh, probably the most popular way to make chromosome scale genome assemblies is proximity ligation sequencing. I will talk about this just a little bit tomorrow. There's no uh, examples of it, but it's, it's important to understand at some level. The basic way this works is your genome is a complex folded mass, right? So the human genome end to end is like two meters long but each of those has to fit into a nucleus, which is absolutely tiny. So it gets folded you know, a billion times over on itself. And the way it's doing that is uh, with these protein complexes, or at least part of it is this protein complex that helps it fold. They're called histones. And the DNA is wrapped around those histones. And so what you do with proximity ligation sequencing is you cross-link those proteins using chemical treatments. And what that will do is it'll kind of fix the three-dimensional genome in space. Then you find ways to cut the DNA and ligate it to what's around it. The idea being that now your DNA um, will have relationships among each other that are based on their orientation in the three-dimensional genome rather than along the linear genome itself, right? Because we didn't digest it first and remove all the protein. We actually use the protein to fix that three-dimensional structure when they try to measure it. The important point is that this will get you uh, sequencing reads that are sequencing read pairs that are relatively near to each other across the linear genome, but can still span up to megabases. So they can be millions of base pairs apart. So you can use that to figure out how to put a genome back together when it's separated into tons and tons of tiny little bits. And again, I'll talk about that more tomorrow and emphasize again what this is. All right, so what do we get? We're gonna, this is, uh, this is gonna be your raw, uh, not raw, it's processed, but basically raw unit of population genomics inference. It's FASTQ format data files. Um, they're a sequence and they're the probability that each base in a sequence is correct, more or less. Um, and so the way this works is you'll get something like this. And so what this is here is um, a single read. So a FASTQ file will typically have millions of reads, each of which is represented by four separate lines. And it must always be four lines or your parsers won't work and everything else won't work. So four lines. Um, it will have a unique sequence ID. This usually corresponds in Illumina to the cluster on the flow cell that was being read by that device. Uh, it can be a couple of different things. It doesn't really matter as long as it's unique and doesn't match all the others in this file. It starts with an at as well, a little at symbol. After that, you will get a DNA sequence, GA, GGA, blah, 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 in this case. You will get a spacer line. So it starts with a plus and it can be followed by anything. Everybody ignores this line and you should too. There's almost no information there ever. Finally, uh, you'll have what's called the quality string. And the quality string is sort of the most useful part of this besides the sequence itself. Um, the way this works is uh, each of these sites corresponds to the probability that a base at the same position in this string is correct. So for example, this A represents a probability and I'll explain how in just a second, that that G is correct. And this G represents a probability that this A is correct, this percent, is it probably this G is correct? It's called ASCII encoded. Uh, and I'll, there's lots of translation tables. I'll explain what this is in just a second here. The important point is it can tell us how accurate a given site is. Um, this is actually often not used at all in genome assembly, but is extremely important for downstream genotyping, particularly when you're doing uh, likelihood-based probabilistic things. You really need to know, can I trust this site or not? So it is tremendously important. I highly recommend paying attention if you've ignored the rest of this, this part matters. Um, okay, this often comes as paired end. As I mentioned earlier, you often get, uh, you often with Illumina data at least, will sequence from two different ends of the same molecule. In that case, what will happen is you'll get two files back. 
Each of these files will have uh, almost the same sequence IDs at the same positions, except typically followed by underscore one and underscore two or dot one, dot two, a few different variants of that. The important point is that uh, the same position in a file, so the first read must match the first read in the second file and the first, right? They came from the same molecule. Okay. What's this, what is this quality line? I said I'd explain this. This is ASCII encoded. And you can look this up. There's lots of tables for this online, but the idea is um, you can go from this to the ASCII code, right? So if we look up A on our table here, we will see that the symbol A is here, which corresponds to ASCII code 65, um, which for reasons I don't fully understand gets, uh, is then corresponding to a Q score of 32 because you subtract 33. Uh, there were different versions of this in the past. So you should be aware that it is possible to get data with a slightly different ASCII encoding of the qualities. Uh, so please try to look that up when you get it and pay attention. The vast majority of your data may look something like this. I would expect it to. Um, so this quality line would translate to, if you were to go through the whole thing, right? So the A was 64, as we said. We do the next one, which is G, you're down here. That's 71. Uh, next is 37. So percent is not a very good quality by comparison. These exclamation points are terrible. When you see them in your reads, it's real bad. Um, and so this reads pretty variable, right? It has extremely um, high FRED bases and extremely low FRED bases. So right, what we've done now uh, is just take it from these ASCII symbols to what's called FRED scaled quality, which is ASCII, the ASCII code minus 33. From there, you want to translate that to probability, right? So that, that doesn't tell us much yet. Uh, we're using what's called FRED scaling. Uh, there's a very nice Wikipedia article about this that you can look it up if it's confusing. But uh, basically, you want to think of it as negative 10 times log 10 that the probability this is incorrect should be equal to your Q score. So if you had a FRED Q score of 30, it would equal negative 10 times log 10 p. And if you solve this, uh, which hopefully you can all do, and if you can't uh, look into it a little bit, there's, there's also explanations of that, you'd get a probability of an error of about one in a thousand. So Q30 would be pretty good for raw sequence data. Um, and in, in fact, uh, just to be very straightforward about this, Fred, Q scores are used for all kinds of different things. So it's really important you understand these. It's in the raw read data, but it also describes the accuracy of the genome assemblies we make. We also use it to encode, uh, or at least FRED scaling, we often use to encode our genotype likelihoods. You should get really, really comfortable with, with thinking about how to encode, uh, encode these probabilities or likelihoods in FRED scaling. So, so get used to this idea. It's gonna come up again and again and again in genomics and bioinformatics, so you'll see it. Um, hopefully that's not too bad though, right? The basic idea is I wanna be able to use this to figure out if I can trust the space in this read. Uh, and, and, each sequencer has slightly different ability to do this well, each sequencing technology, but most of them are actually getting pretty good at figuring out when you really, really can't trust a base. In fact, Illumina is quite good at it now. They've, they've done a lot of benchmarking. Um, okay, so um, let's do a little bit of practice here. Uh, I'll just walk you through how I would do this if it was me. Uh, if we have, we wanna know which of these reads might be more reliable, right? So you actually don't care about the sequence at all. You can basically skip that. You really just want to go straight to this quality score. By the way, this isn't actually fast Q format. I'm just realizing now because the quality string isn't as long as my read string. So this is a terrible example. Make sure your quality and your uh, your sequence have the exact same length of those strings. Otherwise, you've got a problem. Let's imagine I didn't do that briefly. Um, if we were to go through these, we'd say, well, let's look up the first exclamation point. That's here. ASCII code 33, Q score zero. Okay, that's not great. Dollar sign, ASCII code 36, Q score three. All right, you keep going. You see that all of these kind of live in this section of my ASCII table, which means that they have very low Q scores, which means they're not very reliable. In contrast, if we go to read two, which goes A, G, A, C, uh, carrot, carrot, you see that those correspond to ASCII code 65, Q score 32, ASCII code 71 for G, Q code uh, 38, and a couple more here. So you can see that uh, already probably that read two is gonna be the one you wanna use for most thing, right? So read one, if you, if you were to write these all out, corresponds to Q scores of zero, three, four, two, three, zero, um, which you can translate to probability errors of 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.53, 0 0, et cetera. Um, probably 
one is not reasonable. It's unlikely that the base is guaranteed to be incorrect. Otherwise, you'd pick a different base and have some probability that it's right. But minimally, I think you can ignore uh, most genotype calls with Q scores of zero. <laughs> it's a reasonable way to think about this. Um, and the same is basically true down here if you do the same sort of thing, except that again, remember this is log scale. So if I go from zero to 32, that's literally three orders of magnitude in probability um, of, of error or correct. And in this case, what you'll see is that uh, the probability of errors for this read are very, very low. So just the first three come out to extremely small numbers, meaning we can really, really trust this read. Um, a good rule of thumb is when I scroll through my raw data, I often just look at the quality scores immediately just to get an idea if, uh, if there was something wrong with the sequencing run or if there's some reason I shouldn't trust these data because something just didn't work right. Um, that still happens, although molecular biology is getting a lot more robust for these sorts of things. Uh, it's still possible to get a failed sequencing run or have kind of screwy data come off your machine. Um, it's really important to look at these quickly and just get an idea if my data is any good or not. As I said, we don't often use these scores in genome assembly. It's often done agnostic to quality scores, uh, but it will matter a ton uh, when you get to Torfin's section of the class where he's going to use quality scores quite a lot, is my guess. Um, okay, so quality control. How do I recommend you do this? We're, we're going to have not that much time here at the end due to that brief interruption. So um, I'll try to get through this section and then we'll, we'll I'll have to pick up time, but the, the basic idea is um, this is one of the key metrics you can use to look at your raw data. What I basically recommend you do, so when you get a pile of data off the sequencer from your collaborators, what should you do? The very first thing I recommend you do is throw it into a program called FastQC. Um, I've thrown at the bottom here, you can find a GitHub that has the most recent version of this. You can install it by Conda, and I think even the Ubuntu Aptitude repository has FastQC as well. It's really easy to get it. Um, it will produce, uh, it will take your data and give you all sorts of useful feedback about it so you have a clear idea of what kind of quality your sequencing data has and what you can make from it. So it'll do a few different things. Uh, they're just shown off here on the left. As I said, I'm not going to do an in-person example because it takes a little too long for today. We'll have to do it next time. But uh, just to give you a quick run through of the kinds of stuff that it will tell you, you'll see the uh, per base sequence quality. So right, what it's showing you in this tab, and it's the only one I'll do because it's static, is the quality per position in a read. So that would correspond, if this was Illumina data, to the cycle number. Remember, Illumina is done in cycles. You add a base, uh, you take a picture, you cleave it, uh, you add the next base, right? So cycle one was pretty good, right? Your mean quality or your median quality is up here at around 33. So clearly that's, that's actually a pretty excellent cycle, but you can see it falls off pretty quickly to the point where your median is down here at 28. And actually there's lots and lots of sequences that are completely unreliable out at cycles 37, 38, 39, right? The quality basically goes down over the sequencing run. Uh, that is really, really normal uh, for Illumina data. So don't worry. In fact, this would still be a pretty good run. I wouldn't worry that much despite what this says, but it's something to, be, to know to look at. Um, okay, so uh, you'll also have the per sequence quality scores. Do you have some reads that are just unreliable? You'll have uh, per base pair sequence content. So in other words, uh, are there cycles that only produced um, A's for adenine? If that's true, you probably have a problem. It's something you should, lo you should look at. Um, there's quite a few others. And probably the most useful will be these two, which is the per base pair GC content. You would like your reads GC content, that is the amount of Gs and Cs uh, in a given position or in a given read to match your genome wide average more or less. And if it doesn't, there's a pretty good chance something went wrong with your amplification or with your molecular biology upstream. Um, and if that happens, you can be happy because as the bioinformatics person on the project, you can just come back with, somebody messed this up, not my problem, figure it out. <laughs> um, uh, and, and it can be really useful to quickly know this kind of thing. Okay, as we go down, another thing I find incredibly useful, these two at the bottom, overrepresented sequences and KMER content. The basic idea is, let's imagine something went wrong with my sequencing prep such that my adapter sequences are inserted inside of the reads themselves. Um, that will become obvious because you'll read the exact same sequence many, many times over, and FastQC will discover that because it counts all of the KMERs and all of your reads. So you can very quickly just see this. Okay, um, and we're gonna be about out of time here. So I'm probably also not gonna do this demo of the SRA. I'll set it in next time because it's just gonna take a little too long. 
But the, the big idea is, and I'll, I will also try to create a Conda environment, assuming everyone has a Unix system, to, so you'll have all this stuff installed very easily. But the, the big idea here is that there's a set of tools that you can use to interface with the sequence read archive on the command line. For now, what I'm going to do is just show you um, what, is, uh, what the SRA looks like in the kind of web portal, which I find useful for exploring the kind of data, but I don't think is necessarily going to be that advantageous to most people. So um, to be clear, this is the NCBI sequence read archive. Uh, there's a European version as well hosted by the EBI, the European Bioinformatics Institute, and a couple other folks, Ensemble's a part of this. Um, they're basically the same thing. Uh, the Japanese also have a version of this as well. They're all basically the same thing. And in fact, they tend to mirror each other's data most of the time. There's a very few examples where they don't. So if you're more comfortable using the other ones, it doesn't matter. They all kind of interface the same way. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, I just want to show you this so you get an idea of what's out here. So let's imagine we want to look up something that will have a good amount, but not an insane amount of sequence data. Let's look up honeybees, right? Apis mellifera. So you can use search terms at the top to pull these down. It looks like I misspelled the species name because it's correcting me with two L's, uh, which is great. Let's do that. Um, it'll pull this up, right? Okay, we got a lot more, that's good. Um, so what you'll see is a summary of the data that comes out of this. And you can, you can sort it all kinds of different ways. On the right, you can sort by taxon. So NCBI knows what species they are or approximately what species they are. And you'll see that the top hit, as you might expect, matches this. It's honeybees, Apis mellifera. But the rest of this has the metagenomes, metagenomes. So in other words, somebody took honeybees squeezed the microorganisms out of them and sequenced those. Um, so you could filter uh, using these kinds of approaches. So for example, let's look at just the Apis mellifera entries and take a look at those. Um, so that's one quick filter you can apply um, that, will then, that will then narrow down the number of runs you're looking at quite a lot. Other ways you can filter the runs are actually on the right or on the left here. So for example, I might want RNA sequencing data, or let's use DNA in this case, or DNA sequencing data, right? I sequence the genome or I sequence the RNA. Let's try DNA. Okay, and let's imagine I also want uh, paired end reads, right? You can sort by single or paired. Um, and you can also sort by the sequencing platform, right? So they have all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, Illumina is the one I've talked about the most today, and you can see that it has made the absolute bulk of these data, right? So 90 something percent of the data was clearly Illumina. Uh, of paired end reads, but there's other stuff on here like BGI seq, which is um, for all and in, most intents and purposes, basically you can treat the data the same as Illumina data. There's a few differences, but it's not particularly important. It's cycle based, has the same basic principles underlying it. Um, and it's also becoming popular in large part because it's cheap. Um, okay, but let, anyway, let's imagine we do Illumina. The point is, you can very quickly filter your runs to explore by this web interface the kinds of stuff you might be interested in. You see all kinds of cool stuff, right? DNA methylation of larva, functional genomics data. Um, the reason I do that, I mention this is that if you think of a cool experiment or a cool study you want to do, there's a very good chance that somebody has already made your data that you would need and has put it online and, uh, and probably used it for a completely different question than the one you are trying to answer. So there's a very good chance you'll find stuff you're excited about here. Um, Next time, I will show you a little bit about how to use uh, how to use the command line version of this toolkit to download raw data uh, and and operate with that raw data as well. Okay, <clears throat> and I think that's going to be it for this time. Um, thanks so much, everyone, and uh, I'll take uh, any questions you have now. <clears throat> so it better be some questions. Uh, thank you for clarifying that, Anastasia. Yes, by tomorrow, I mean next week. So <laughs> to be clear, that's uh, it will not be tomorrow. It will be next week. Um, and again, uh, I haven't looked at your doodle poll yet. I'm going to basically assume that most of you can have a Unix-based system of some kind. Uh, oh, by the way, I conducted the poll, and uh, yes, they do. There okay. are just a couple of people who need to install it. OK. Uh, fantastic. Uh, if you're going to be doing any amount of bioinformatics, you're going to want to have a nice Unix-based system of some kind that you can be on because you will use it all the time. Um, but yeah, uh, and so I'll, I'll get working on, on creating a Conda environment I can distribute. Can I get a quick idea? 
Have any of you seen Conda before? Do you know what I'm talking about when I say this? Uh, Conda, right? Yeah. I think most of them. Most of you. Okay, great. That, this will be easy. Now. Because it is uh, necessary for just any data analysis. I mean, it's not necessary, but it makes it a lot easier. <laughs> That's true. Um, it's like a standard to have it, Conda installed. It is basically. I just want to make sure I'm, uh, I'm giving you guys the information you need, but that's great. Cool. All right, then I will see you all uh, next week if there's no questions. Yeah, not tomorrow, certainly. Not, not tomorrow. <laughs> next week. Okay, good. So, well, uh, thank you, Russell. Thanks sure. everyone for participating. And next time, I think there will be more questions. Yeah, especially how. The hell do I install Conda? Yes, that's great. We can do those too. I'll try to, um, hopefully my internet will work a little better and it'll be easier. We'll see you guys there. <laughs> All right. Goodbye. Thank you. So see good. you guys. Goodbye, Thank you. everyone. Goodbye. <coughs> Goodbye.